I'd like to welcome everybody to Camby Chess Club's Zoom weekly Zoom meeting. Um, I think this is number 50, 50 something. Steve will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we've been going ever since the lockdown in March 2020. Um, tonight, our guest speaker is um, an inter international master, Nigel Povar, uh, from Guildford in Surrey. Um, I'll just do a little, a small, very small potted history. Um, Nigel was involved with the very strong Stratham and Brixton Chess Club in the 70s, and uh, I think was involved in the production of this. Oh, you probably can't see that. Because <laughs> of my back, yes. <laughs> because of my background, let's get rid of the background. I'll just turn that off. Where's the thing? Okay. Ah, yeah. Oh, you can see my embarrassing. <laughs> okay, so there's Nightmare Two, Nightmare Three. Anyone remember these? But Ken does. Oh yeah, yeah. Ken contributed to them. Well, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I did. <laughs> yes. And then uh, I think Nigel had a the first book. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was this one, which came out in 1980? When I had hair. Oh my <laughs> God, Nigel. <laughs> And jumpers were much more stylish. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1982, there was this one on the English opening. Yeah. Uh, Good Lord. And then 1983, there was another one on the English. Oh, oh. I recognise that. Yeah. yeah. And I think there was another one after that, wasn't there, Nigel, which, which I don't own, but I think it was how, <clears throat> something to do with the English as well, if I remember correctly. No, just the two on the English. Um, oh, was it? Okay. And then there was there was also a book on the Sicilian Lasca Pelican. Oh yeah, I should have got that one. Yeah. Otherwise known as the Sveshnikov, of course, today. Five e five, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, most people won't realise this. I think you had three books that were nothing to do with chess, um, to do with business. That's right. Um, is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, also in 1980, that was the year that FIDE awarded Nigel the International Master title. It was 83, I actually awarded. I, I got the title in 81, but yeah. it took two years for them to actually award it. It was a bit of a pain. So I got it in 83. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully um, most people will know <coughs> who our guest is. Um, so I think it's probably time to hand over to Nigel. Okay. Okay, right. Well... Can I first of all thank you for inviting me to this session and it's been a pleasure to uh, spend some time with you all and uh, to uh, give you some insights into some end games that um, I found quite interested in my uh, uh, research uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and not knowing exactly what the standard was going to be of the people attending tonight, I've tried to cater for um, people from one level right up to you know a high level so we've got quite a range and um, that means I'm covering some very basic positions but some very key and important principles but equally some more sophisticated positions. I'm going to focus uh, on king and pawn endings and rook and pawn endings just those two because they're both incredibly rich in material terms and uh, I note that we've got a couple of Guildford people here Mike Gunn and uh, Julian Shepley, both of whom may have seen some of this before, so apologies um, for the repetition, but that may be useful in terms of reinforcement. Anyway, let me start by sharing my screen. Um, and here we come, I hope, yep. Right, so hopefully you can all see that screen, yeah? It's a chess-based screen, um, and we've got, uh, both the kings on the board and a single pawn on the g4 square. And this first um, position is all about illustrating uh, the importance of a gaining control and access to the three green highlighted squares, um, which are referred to often as key squares, because if the white king can gain control of those squares, then the pawn on g4 can be guaranteed promotion. So the real issue here is how does one uh, go about it? I think White's first move is pretty obvious. I'll, I'll um, give you that one. 
Um, I'll use this, I think. Yep. And Black's going to make his way towards the pawn. And now we get our first question. What's what's the right move here? Any suggestions, please? King G3. Yeah, any other thoughts? No? So... Um, King G3. Yeah, King G3. Nobody tempted to play King F3? No? Okay. Well, King G3 is the right move, but let me just show you why King F3 is the wrong move. If you were to play your king here, assuming that you know moving up towards those three squares I showed you a second ago could be achieved by this move, you'll find, unfortunately, that it fails. The blacks play as follows. Now, if white carries on up, black obtains, as most of you, I'm sure, are familiar, what we call the opposition. This is when the two kings are facing one another, and it's the side who's turn it is to move who has lost the opposition so in this case white has lost the opposition now okay white has got a pawn um but if he were to advance that pawn in this position well, I, i'm not going to bother showing it to you what's happened here is that the white pawn is in front of the white king and when you get that situation it's jolly difficult to force the pawn home if the defender plays accurately so if we go back and start again and just play the correct move, which is king to g3, you'll see a, a key difference. Black plays king e6 again, and now we go to h4. Black comes across to f6. White goes to h5. So you can see the route that the white king has taken. And now black's really only got one sensible move here, king to g7. And now what move does white play? In G5. Yeah, absolutely important that you do not push the pawn forward because by pushing the pawn forward, again, the white king no longer remains in front of the um, um, the uh, the king. And after pawn to G5, what would happen is black would play king to H7. Black has the opposition. This position is now drawn. So we just go back a couple of moves and play the correct king to G5. We now have the those three green highlighted squares I showed at the beginning, the two kings are opposing one another. This is the direct opposition. And now it's black to move and black must move his king either to F7 or H7. And in this example, where we'll play F7. And um, then what happens is the white king outflanks. And this is the whole concept of promoting the pawn. It's a combination of gaining the opposition and using your king to outflank. And uh, the procedure now is that you can even advance the pawn here. You don't even need to play king g6 because the advance of the pawn leads quite simply to, and that's it, king f7, king h7, and the pawn queens. So a very simple example, and um, one to start with, um, which I hope most of you are familiar with, if not, if not all of you. But now we can move on to um, some other positions where these sorts of principles come into play. And now we get our first test as to when I close this, whether we lose sharing. I, I hope we won't, but we'll see. Maybe we haven't. I don't know. Let's get rid of that and choose another position. Right. Yes, you're OK with that. Yes, you can all see that. We've still got the old position, Nigel. Have I? I've got to stop share and restart. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. About that. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. This could be a slightly irritating. Well, we're used to it. It's okay. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a shame it's just not smooth and seamless. It's the, it's the way chess base, base interact with Zoom, I think. Yeah. Right. A different uh, position. For Mac, do you want to maximise that one? Yep. Good plan. Um, view. Yes. Maximise. Oops. Get away. It's one full screen. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, with this position, white enjoys in this position, the distant opposition. Note that the white king's on e5, black king's on a5, both on black squares, um, three squares between them. This is referred to as the distant opposition, but it's white to play. So black actually has the opposition here, albeit the distant opposition. So what does white play here? Any suggestions? King 
King E6. King E6. Right. If we go King E6, which I think was a uh, black, will now play King A6, maintaining the distant opposition. What now? King, maybe uh, King F5 might have been a better first move. Cause okay, that's... let's go back. And there it is, King F5, exclamation mark. I don't know who suggested that, but well done, whoever it was. Um, the reason that this is the correct move is that black can't use the corresponding B5 square because it's guarded by the pawn on C4. So in this situation, black has to lose the opposition. So for example, if he goes to b6, what does white play here? King f6. Correct. And now if black goes b7? Suggestion? King f7. Correct. Maintaining the opposition. Now, what happens now is that if black goes king to, let's say, b8, then what does white play here? King e6. Pardon? King e6. Correct. You, you outflank. I showed you the concept of outflanking a moment ago in the first position. You go the opposite way. So if we just go back, just to illustrate the point here, if black goes to b6 in this position, instead of b8, then we go to e8, it's outflanking. Um, and this is our main line, so I'll stay with this. Both achieve the same outcome because after this opposition, after, so we say that, then we can outflank. When he comes back, we can now obtain the opposition. Note we've got the direct opposition here. And when black moves his king away, well, if he goes to b6, say we, we keep the pawns guarded. Um, the simplest move is to outflank. And after this, it's all over. Both the c pawns, black two c pawns are going to be lost. And then the white c4 pawn will be shepherded home without any difficulty. So again, it illustrates the uh, importance of um, gaining the opposition and outflanking. And those are some key fundamental concepts in king and pawn endings, the most basic principles that you, you need to appreciate when you get down to a, some very simple king and pawn positions. So we're gonna to go to another position now. As I say, these initial positions are relatively simple. Um, but I need to stop share again, choose another position. Hang on a second. Right, okay. Um, seem, to have, seem to have lost you all for some reason. Why have I lost you? Oh, you are? Okay, share screen. Right. Everybody see that one? And yeah. I'll maximize the screen again. Oh no, we are maximizing. It is maximized, yeah. yeah. I think I think after a while it, it maintains a pattern. Um, okay, so in this position, it's it's white to play. Um, the thing is though, if you look at this position, your first thought is, oh, I want to take my king and rush it over and grab that V7 pawn and queen my b6 pawn. But actually, if we try that, you'll see um, it's one of the options. You'll see a major problem. So we'll start with that. King to g5 looks like an obvious move and black plays the, as follows. And now we reach a critical position and you see there's two squares highlighted in red. And in endgame theory, king and pawn endgame theory, these are sometimes referred to 
as mind squares, because whoever treads on the mind square first loses. Because in this instance, it's going to be white that's going to lose this, because in this position, in order to save the B6 pawn, white needs to go to C7, black then goes to A6, and now white will need to move away, losing the B6 pawn, and it's black who's going to win because he's going to be able to escort his B pawn up the board and white won't be able to do anything about that. So that means, if we go back to the beginning, the king to G5, which is the move we played just now, is wrong and loses. But if you, once you've come to recognise that in this particular position, you should realise, therefore, that white cannot win this and indeed, White therefore has to set about trying to draw this. And the way he wants to go about doing that is to get his king to the B4 square, the square that I've highlighted, after Black has captured on B6, immediately after I might add, because then White would have achieved the opposition. Now, the interesting thing about this particular position is that the White king from H4 to B4 can get there and this is one of the amazing things about the geometry of the chessboard, there are 141 different routes that will take the white king from h4 to b4. But only one of those 141 routes will deliver the draw. <laughs> Rather scary as a thought. However, it's not that difficult once you um, get the idea. Um, so, what do you think White's first move should be? King G3. G4. King G3, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. G4 loses. G3 is the only move. Uh, we know G5 loses. Let's look at why G4 loses. That comes King C2. We come... We're heading to B4, don't forget. But black can also take different routes towards B6. And black goes here. And this is another concept that I want to stress and emphasize to you in King and Pawn Unions. It's called shouldering. You use your king, like, you, like in a football match, when you're trying to tackle another player and you shoulder him to kind of keep him away from you, barge him away almost. You use your king here to prevent the white king from advancing. And in this position, the black king has made progress. He's moved up one rank. And in this position, white actually can make no useful move to help him get to B4. Whatever he does, black will get there more quickly. For example, it wouldn't make any difference if he went to F4, I might add. And we see now that we do not get to the B4 square in time, and black now gains the opposition. And the, the game is now lost, because the black king will be able to stay ahead of the B pawn as he makes progress and advances up the board. So let's go back, and let's look at the correct route of play. So the right move, king G3. Black plays king C2 again. And now the right move? King F2. Is that Julian? No, Peter. Uh, that's all right, Peter. You're forgiven. I thought it might be Julian. I think he might have seen this before, you see. So, <laughs> but if you haven't, Julian, apologies. <laughs> um, right. Yes, King F2 is correct. And then the Black King has to make his way up the board. There's not much point in Black trying to keep you at bay with King D2 because you simply go King F1. You don't go F3, you go F1. And the whole point is you're going to come up behind the Black King. And obviously he can, if he wants, play King D1. But, you know, after King F2, King there, he's not really made any progress. And the minute he sets off towards the other way, I don't know if I've gone any further, if you were to go King C3 here, you would go King E2, and you're coming in behind the King. And you'll see that anyway in the next example. So let's, let's just pop back and very quickly run through these moves. So King E1 is the correct move. So we come down a nice direct diagonal. And now the black king, if he wants to get near, he's got to head for that B6 form. Sorry. Um, off he goes. And we come up behind him. And bingo. So there's the route. There's the one route 
from h4 to b4 that allows white to secure the draw. Any other route by the white king would allow the black king to shoulder you away. Quite an incredible piece of geometry on the board and, and not at all obvious. And it's again, knowing about these concepts that means when you play your king and pawn endings, you won't just bang your moves out without any thought. You know, you'll start to appreciate some of the subtleties of these positions. By the way, can I assume everyone understands why this position is drawn? Anybody not clear why this is drawn? Happy to explain if it's not clear to you. Um, could I just ask, I mean, is it, is it relevant here that the black pawn hasn't moved, so it's got the choice of moving one or two in terms of the opposition? Not really, because in this position, um, let's say it's black's move here. Let's assume black played his king to the side and the white king maintained the opposition. You're now going to have to move your pawn or keep moving your king. And if you keep moving your king, I'll, I'll you know, dance with you. So you're going to have to move your pawn. And whether you move it one or two squares makes no difference because the key thing is the black king is no longer in front of the pawn whether it moves one or two squares. Let's move one square with the pawn and uh, we'll see. And what white does here is go there. What does black do here? He's got to advance the pawn again, hasn't he? Not, nothing else makes much sense. So he goes pawn on again. And now what we do as white is we bring our king back. Black king comes up. We face him with the opposition. And then once again, and this position just continues all the way down the board until finally it's stalemate, you know. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this sort of concept. These moves just play themselves. And this is the critical position that all of you should know. And, and if you don't know, make sure you memorize this. The right king move here is always to drop your king directly back because then whichever side the black king now steps, you step the same way to face him. And we then get the well-known stalemate. And there's no way, if you play that accurately, that black can deviate from that in any meaningful fashion. Okay, so I'll leave that then. I hope that's a useful point illustrated and uh, we'll move on to our next position. Um, which is something, again, a number of you may know. So uh, let's just close this one. No, we don't need to save that. And we're gonna go for a famous position. That, um, and here again. Right. A position I'm sure quite a lot of you have seen before. Number of you familiar with this one? Yep. Yep. Do you know yes. who the uh, composer was? Retty. Yep, it was Retty. Now, are, are there some of you that have never seen this before? Because obviously, if you've all seen it before, uh, one, one could argue it doesn't need much time. Is there anyone here who's never seen this before? Don't be embarrassed to own up. It's useful. Oh, I've never seen it before. No, not that Good. I know. Great. Well, thank you for, for your honesty. That is appreciated. Right. The interesting thing about this position is that the white pawn is two squares away from queening. However, the black king is next to it or very near to it on a6. The white king, however, is, you know, two ranks at least behind the black pawn on h5. And therefore, it simply looks like white is lost here because there's no way the white king will be able to chase after that h pawn, it was thin. But it's very easy for the black king to stop the c6 pawn. However, Retty showed that there is, in fact, a very uh, clever defensive resource here, and it goes as follows. The white king comes to g7. Rather than go to h7, don't forget what I said in the last position about multiple routes to get from a to b. There are multiple routes to get up the board chasing that h pawn, and you don't need to go to h7 mm -hmm. when you can go to g7, because going to g7 offers you more choice where you go next. Now, in this position, black's got a choice of two moves. He either advances <clears throat> pawn 
or he plays king to b6 to snaffle the um the um the white pawn let's assume he goes king to b6 well after that white would go here and now again there's a choice of two moves either black takes the pawn with king takes c6 but then king g5 wins the black pawn so really there's only one move isn't there pawn here however in this position white plays the very, very clever king here and the whole point about this move is that he is now threatening a to go to f4 and chase the h4 pawn or b to go to d6 to ensure that his c6 pawn can be helped to queen and to illustrate that let's yeah, first look finished it's it's obviously clear that after king takes c6 king to f4 and this pawn on h4 is lost um but let's look at the more obvious move, pawn on to h3. Well, white would play king here, pawn on to h2. White plays here, and both sides can queen now, and that's drawn. And if black tries to stop the queening, white can do the same. Now, both sides will queen with a drawn position. So let's go back. And start again. And this time, we'll rather than play the rather unquestionable king b6, we'll play the more obvious h4. We still play f6, and now, same question as before, does black go king b6 or does he push his pawn? Well, if he goes with the pawn push, which is the different variation, he go king e6. Now notice the geometry here. There's no way that white king is now catching the pawn on h3. However, there's no way now that the c6 pawn isn't going to queen because white can play king to d7 and shepherd the pawn home if, uh, and only if, the black king tries to stop it. If black just advances his pawn two squares, white will advance his pawn two squares. So this position is dead equal. But it, the incredible thing is when you look at it at the beginning, you just would assume not. Now, because we're all so familiar with this Reti study, um, or well, most of us are. It's been it's been much published and is is well known to many people. You know, we see this position and we think, ah, oh, yes, I know that Reti, and we know it's a draw, and it's this very clever king journey. The point I want to make, though, is that there are other positions with this similar principle, and I want to illustrate one or two of those to you. So we'll finish with this and move on to another. By by all means, by the way, if you've got any questions for me, please shout them out. Right, uh, stop share and share again. Okay, so we've got another one now. And this is not Reti's, obviously, but this is a study by a guy named Morovec from 1952. And again, very similar to the Reti position it looks like white's in trouble because the white pawn on e5 is going to try and queen on e8 but then there's a black king very nearby whereas black's got a pawn over on a7 that will take five moves to reach a1 whilst the white king is on h3 so you know you'd think can white save this well the first white move is not too difficult the white king moves off the uh, h-file and goes to, sorry, to g4. We then get black, come on, oh, here we go. Black now has a choice. He can either move his king to try and stop the e-pawn, but more likely he's going to try and start rushing his a-pawn. And now white plays his king to f5. Still looks pretty grim for for um for white because the black king can just slide across to e8, and if he can do that, that white pawn on e5 is never going to queen. But there is a challenge here, and the challenge is this: I I are a number of you familiar with the term the square in king and pawn endings? Yeah, the yeah. square is um made up by looking at 
the number of squares required to get from the square you're on to the queening square, and then making that into a square. So our square in this position is made up of the squares E5, uh, sorry, A5, A1, E5, and E1. So those four squares make up the corners of our so-called square. What that means is that white is threatened to enter the square with king e4. And if it were white's move, king e4 would ensure the draw because he would then be able to catch that a pawn. So for that reason, black has to push his pawn to keep it running. Now the square is made up of the squares you know, a4 to d4 to d1 to a1. And the white king is outside that square. But in this position, white can uh, still play for uh, the draw, believe it or not, by what move? King e6. King e6. King e6. 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 Yeah. Um, right, does e6 work? Um, I think, yeah, that probably does work, actually. Um, King F6, Nigel, I think. Sorry? Doesn't King F6 also work? Uh, no, King F6 doesn't. But uh, and maybe King E6 doesn't. The, the correct move in my solution is King G6. And I'm thinking King E6 probably doesn't. King E6... No, King E6 doesn't work, uh, I don't think. But anyway, let me show you the correct solution. The correct solution is G6. And not f6, why not f6? Let's go back, sorry. So this is why f6 doesn't work. a3, d6. Yeah, and we're gonna queen with check, aren't we? So pawn here, and this is check. And that's the trouble. And the same I think you'll find is gonna be, it's not so much a check, but you know, if we go back, if you go king to e6, we're going to have this. Oh, not that. You're a move too slow, aren't you? Go here. And that's now a draw. Oh, sorry, a loss. Because the pawn isn't going to queen in time. So that's why if we go back, the right move is king to g6. And a4. Yeah, g6. And watch what happens now. And now we go e6 because it's a pawn race. We're just going to push the pawns, both of us, unless the black king tries to intervene. And when he does try to intervene, we step into f7. Exactly the same as with the Reti study. It's the same principle. Getting the king to shepherd the pawn home. But just to remind you, we started from a very different position. And the, the solution was king g4, king f5, king g6. A bit like the Reti study where we started on h8 and went g7, f6, e5, and then to d6. So a similar sort of concept. And again, it illustrates the geometry of the chessboard. Okay, I've got another example. And this one's a lot more complex. Right. Let you all take that in for a few seconds. Has anyone seen this position before? It's quite a famous study that I saw many years ago, and then I saw it recently in a magazine. I've seen it once, yes. Yeah. I have seen it, but I can't remember it. Yeah. It's a classic. Um, it was uh, done by Troitsky in 1913. And uh, there are some very clever features in this position. Okay, it's white to move. So white is, you know, white is winning this. 
for one reason. Who can tell me what the one reason is that White's winning this? Uh, Queen side majority. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. I An agree. outside past pawn. An A pawn. So what's the right move for White here? And if you know this, don't shout out. Let, let somebody who maybe has not seen it before um, see what they think. What's the right move here? A4. A4? Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look at that. A4. Right. What's the problem for White now? Going to get mated with the H pawn if we're not careful. Well, it's not a question of if you're not careful. <laughs> it's now inevitable. Black is going to. It only takes five moves for that pawn. One, two, three, four moves. I beg your pardon. Four moves for that pawn to get to H two, and you know that means that White can queen. But it doesn't matter. So we go back. So what that means is we can't play a4. So what do we do? King takes g2. Okay, let's try king g2, which is another question mark, I'm afraid. And the reason it's question mark is this. Now, you can see my arrows, I hope, on that position. Yes? Everybody see the arrows? Yeah. I hope it's showing. Good. That is yes. the square. Yeah? The square. The square of the A pawn. The black king is inside the square of the A pawn. And the black king is going to make the journey E7 to D8 to C8 to B8 or B7 and grab that A pawn. And this position is now one for black. Because there's nothing but white can do to prevent that king journey picking up the A pawn because the other pawns are all in limbo, so to speak. And eventually, once that pawn drops, Black will you know, use his kingside majority to promote. Um, so it's uh, very much in Black's favor. But if we go back to this position, the starting position, we now know we can't play king takes g2 because the Black king gets back into the square of the A pawn. We also know we can't play A4 because King G3 allows us to get mated. So there is one other move here that gives White a chance. C6. Um, C6. Yeah, to control B7. The trouble with C6, um, interesting suggestion, the trouble is Black captures it. Oh, and then goes to oh, G3, oh, yeah. And then he goes King G3 and you get mated. So F6? F6. F6. King. Exactly, well spotted. F6 is the, and obviously big King G3 doesn't work here because we take on G7 and Queen. So Black now has to capture that. And now White has time enough to play the King move. But what he's gained now, is that the f6 square is obstructing the pawn on f6 is obstructing the black king from playing the move king f6. So now white goes off with his pawn. And now this pawn is ready to run. So black now needs to try and get into the square. The pawn um, advances. Again, he tries to come into the square. And now we get another key move. D6? D6. Correct. Exclamation mark. And Black has to take that. Um, if he plays C6, the A pawn will just run through. So he has to take it. What now? C6. Yeah. C5. Sorry? C6. Yeah, C6. Not A5. If you play A5, King. Black plays King D5. And he slides in with C, king to C6 to B7. But if you go back and you do this move instead, and now look at that. White sacrificed all of his pawns by the final A pawn, and the black king can't go to C6. 
So it's an incredible concept of sacking the pawns on f6, d6, and c6. All of those three pawn sacks block the king's journey to get into the square of the white pawn. So it's a beautiful composition, this, and uh, uh, really clever with all the subtle features. Um, but it, again, it builds on sort of the idea of Retty's principle of getting into the square and, and outflanking. All of these concepts are kind of linked. So let's move on. Nigel, I don't think you need to um, unshare anymore. The, the new position seems to be coming up. Oh, good. When you do it, I think. Well, I've been unsharing, so we'll see. <laughs> Does that come up or not? No, that's that's. Has that come up? New position? Yes. Yeah, we can see a new position. You can. Good. Right. Well, this is one of my own games. Um, some years ago. 1982, in fact, and I was black. Um, it's white to play. Um, what's your assessment of this position? I would say it's not good for white because that pawn might promote with check. Right. So, you, mm, crikey, I don't know. Well, if, white to... plays d6, isn't he okay then? Well, what are, what are white's candidate moves here? D6, D6 I would D6. think, is number one. Sorry, is that e6 or d6? No, d. D, right. E6. Any other candidates? E6. E6. Right. So really, it's only those two moves, isn't it, I guess? E6 or D6? And do you oh, think okay. those two moves are any different? Well, D6 is allowing the pawn to be blocked straight away, whereas E6, King F6, is forced. And that's a little bit less... Uh, Clear. I mean, I must confess, I, I say I was black and I'd played a forcing series of about three moves to reach this position, thinking this was one for me. And my opponent played one of the two moves we've talked about and I did win. Had he played the other one, the position was drawn. Um, so it is. this is a critical moment in the game. Um, and it, it, it's it's not immediately obvious which of those, it certainly wasn't to me at the time, um, it isn't immediately obvious which of those two is actually the correct one. Um, but I'll tell you, the actual answer is the correct one is d6. Now in the game, my opponent played e6. And the game finish, it's not too complex, I'll show you, like so. And I'd foreseen more or less this forced variation. And of course, a3. And this was the move my opponent missed. And this is now totally one. Um, you can do nothing. Now, if we go back, and the, the subtle difference is, and, and as I say, I, I was annotating this recently, going through some of my old games, and I had an engine running in the background, and the engine instantly pointed out the correct move here, which I must admit at the time I hadn't thought of. Um, the correct move is d6. Now, obviously, black has to play king to e6, and the play continues in the same fashion. But now, rather than bring the white king back towards the queen side, you take the king up the board. And now the move that saves him, d7, takes forced king left. And again, you should recognize we've seen this same concept in the previous examples of using the king to escort the pawn home. And these two pawns are both going to queen much the same time in a drawn position. Um, but it's seen, and the interesting thing is this illustrates how some of these um, sort of concepts 
that we see in problems and studies do manifest themselves in your games. Okay. King G5 is not very intuitive, is it? No, it wasn't. And, and indeed, my opponent missed it. Um, I mean, in a blitz game, you would be surprised if you even considered it. Well, it wasn't blitz. <laughs> Um, no, no, right. uh, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. But then again, John, the, on the other hand, the more you learn and understand these principles, the more likely you are to sort of uh, think of those moves, even when you're under great time pressure like you are in Blitz. Who, who was that game against, Nigel? Uh, that was against uh, G.J. Nicholson, not not John Nicholson, oh. I don't think. Well, there, there were two Nicholsons. J.G. Nicholson was John Nicholson, yeah. Yeah, they, but... Yeah, but he was only 180 grade, and I'm because I know there were no, sorry, not Nicholson, Cooper. My apologies, Cooper. Uh, John, John Cooper, the Welsh, I am. Oh, no, no, because there were two Jay Coopers, um, and it, it wouldn't have been the Welsh one because he's stronger than that. This guy was graded 180, okay. um, and John Cooper, the Welsh one, was about 200 old. Yeah. Um, anyway, now we've got another position on the board, um, which, um, is a quite an interesting end game, and this is one of Capablanca's. And I'll just play through it just to illustrate the moves. It's a uh, white to play. Let's just get the position up on here. I've got right, okay. So black has just played d4, and the key thing about this pawn on d4, of course, is protected past pawn, and it also uh ensures, therefore, that the white king can never stray very far. He's got to be keeping an eye on that dangerous pawn. But white has got some trumps in this position. What, what do you think the trumps are? He can create pass pawn on both sides. Right. OK. Let's look then at how he does that. So he played f4, first of all. That prevented the black king using the e5 square. Then he played g4, black shuffles his king. He brought his own king up, sensibly. Black just shuffles and the white king comes into its best square. Shuffling continues. And now he played h4, sensible move, preparing to advance on the king side to create that pass ball and black shuffles. Now the white king can't step forward because then the d pawn would, would rush away and promote. So, the winning plan in this position is to create a pass pawn, obviously. Um, but the key thing here is, and I think you know it was mentioned just now, is you've got to create a, two pass pawns because one pass pawn alone isn't going to do it. So, for example, if White played, I think I've got it. If White played g5 here, then you would play like so. And now, in this position, the Black King is obviously able to stop the pawn. However, white has a move here. B4. B4. Yep, B4. This is the key. The, and this is the move that's not obvious because that square looks un unavailable to white because it's hit by two pawns. But whichever way black captures that, white will obtain a pass pawn. And uh, the good thing about this is that the white king is able to control the D and B pawns, whereas the black king cannot obviously control the A and G pawns. So it, it's in fact, if you go back to the starting position, this position is totally won. And it's the interesting thing is this was Capablanca playing white. And no doubt when Black played this position with his pawn to d4, he assumed he was holding this position because, you know, he'd allowed the exchanges to reach this position. And had he realised this was a lost position, he wouldn't have had those, those, those peace exchanges. Um, but Capablanca saw that, A, he could create a pass pawn on the king side, but much less obviously, he could also create the pass pawn with the b4 break, you know. And this is the thing, again, you need to educate yourself to realise that, you know, you can have a pawn break with a move that looks totally suicidal, in this case, b4. But obviously, white has to get his king ready before he can play that. So that's that's all I'm going to say on that particular position. I don't think we need to uh, cover any more of that. 
Who was Capablanca's opponent? Uh, someone named Condi, C-O-N-D-E. I, I don't know who he was. Okay. Now I'm going to just spend. We've we've been going nearly an hour, and I've got three, four more king and pawn positions to show, and then I've got a bunch of rook and pawn positions. Um, and I so we can take a break then. Well, we could, but let no. me also just say this before we do. The no. next four king and pawn endings we're going to look at are more complex than those we've looked at so far, in some ways. Because to, to a large extent, the ones I've covered with you so far cover some fairly straightforward basic principles. Now I want to cover something a little bit more sophisticated, and we can do that after the break. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, what we've got here is the type of king and pawn endgame that we might sometimes reach. And we're going to see a few variations on a theme here. Um, the main common denominator in this is they're all positions where there's a pair of rooks pawns facing one another, which is what we've got on the A file. And the superior side has a passed pawn on the other side of the board. Um, now, in this particular position, um, it's white to play. And what do you think white should do in this particular position? A5. A5, A5 yeah. Is that everybody's agreement? A5, yeah. And why do you think that's a good move? Stop, stop him from getting an extra move in A5. Right. But otherwise, he might be able to force the opposition against you. Yeah. He has okay. to move the king now. Yeah, all right. Well, you are correct. A5 is, in fact, the right move. Um, but let me just explain why. Um, this position has been quite well analysed. and As I say, various variations on a theme have been uh, analysed. And in these positions where um, we've got, as I say, this pair of, eight, pair of rooks pawns and a, a, a pass pawn on the other side of the board, there are some key principles that it's very useful for you to know. The first of those key principles is that if the superior side's rook's pawn passes the halfway line, he wins. So the move a5 ensures the win. If, if white allows black to play a5 in this position, we're going to look at that in a moment, then the pawns are blocked on the halfway line, so to speak. Then the position becomes more intricate. Um, and in this type of position, the other factor that the superior side wants to have happen is he would like his pass pawn not to be as this one is on F5. He would much prefer if it were back on F2. And the reason for that is the black king's got to go a lot further to pick it up, giving the white king ample time to get over to pick up Black's a pawn. So that's the general principle you need to remember. You want your rook's pawns, you want your own rook's pawn as far advanced as possible, and you want your pass pawn further back. But in this particular example, if it's white's move, it's a dead simple win, and I'll show you how. Um, with a5, then the play would continue like this. Game over. You don't even need to worry about trying to queen the F pawn. You can simply run over, grab that A pawn, and then you uh, will be able to escort your own A pawn home. However, if it is Black's move here, we have this position. And now there's a rule that you should all try and remember because it will help you in this position. Dvoretsky, who's done a lot of analysis of this position in his endgame manual, refers to the uh, rook's pawns when they're facing one another in the middle here, one on a4, one on a5, on, on the centre point of the board, so to speak. When they face each other, he calls that the normal position. And it's often that that's where these pawns are because, you know, both sides might have advanced their a pawns earlier in the game. So they're both sitting there. And in such a position, the win is determined by the positioning of the pass pawn now. And it doesn't matter which file that pass pawn is on, it happens to be on the F file here, it could be on the H file, G file, or E file, any of those files, even D file. The rule is that the pawn needs to be behind the line I've drawn from H3 to C8. Not on the line, 
behind it. If the pawn is on the line or ahead of the line, it's a draw. If the pawn is behind the line, it's a win. And the reason is, as I said a moment ago, the further back the white pawn is, the more time it takes the black king to grab it, giving the white king more time to go over and grab the A pawn. So let's illustrate why this position is now a draw, because blacks managed to get A5 in. So we might play like so. And the critical square is C8, or bishop one, depending upon which of you know, which file, which side of the board, it could be H pawns, but um, so it wouldn't be C8, it'd be F8. And the reason is that obviously in this position, the black king is going to be able to get into the corner, or if white tries to stop it like so, then this is going to happen. And here, as you can see, no progress can be made. If A6, black just shuffles up and down uh, C8, C7. And if white comes king B6, black goes king B8, and it's dead drawn. So that's the first one, but I've got a number of games or positions where this concept comes into play. That's the basic principles. Now let's look at how it's applied. Can you all see that one? Yeah. Right. Now this one's more tricky. Um, this is one of a number of studies by a, a guy named Bahr, B-A-H-R, who did a lot of work on this particular type of ending in 1935, would you believe? And he came up with a number of rules, some of which, as I say, Dvoretsky has um, um, adapted. So here you've got this intriguing position. And at the moment, it's um, black to play. Um, and at the moment, white has got the distant opposition, which is why it favours white, because he's got the distant opposition. And after black's move king to e7, and white goes king to e3, white now has maintained his distant opposition, and black now has a critical decision to make. In essence, black has to decide which of his two pawns he's going to abandon the h5 pawn or the a6 pawn, because he's going to lose one of them. So the key question here is, which one should he abandon? I'm guessing it's going to be the a pawn based on your previous comments. Absolutely correct. Um, so the right move for black here is what then? Okay. Well, it's 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 King F7 actually. I mean, I think F6 might suffice, but F7 is better mainly because you, you, if he goes to F4, you want to be able to then go F6 with your position. So F7 is better. But let's look at why King D7 protecting the A6 pawn loses. We'll do that first of all. So if he goes King here, this is what would happen. I'm not having to say much here because I think it's all pretty self-explanatory. Okay, is that clear? So let's go back and now look at the, what happened in the game. And instead, F7. So it, you, it's not easy, I must confess. You know, when I think about this, I think, God, even having studied this position, you've got to remind yourself, which of these pawns am I prepared to give up? And which is the right one to retain? Well, the one we're going to retain is the H pawn. And you're going to see now why, because this is what happens. And by the way, um, it's worth pointing out, let's go back, sorry. There's no merit in going in for a pawn race. If you count the number of moves it takes white to queen the A pawn, white goes king B6 times A6, king moves out the way and then promotes. That takes six moves. If black tries to promote his h pawn he goes king f5 g4 and takes that's three moves out the way four moves and four more moves to promote that's eight moves so eight moves for black to promote six moves for white to promote there's no chance with the pawn race consequently white goes or black goes sorry across 
and achieves the opposition again and tries to box the white king in. Of course, that isn't going to work because there's a pawn to tempo with, and here we go. However, watch this. Bingo. We've got to the critical F8 square, and this is drawn. So we go back to the beginning. I mean, it's as simple as that, really. So the key here is looking at which of the, the position of these two sets of rooks pawns, which one is going to, which one can you afford to lose? You, you can afford to lose the a6 pawn because you can then win the a5 pawn and bring your king back, and he won't be able to promote his h pawn in time. If you do it the other way around, you lose. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay, well, there's another example of that just to help consolidate the principle. Another one, another example from Bar. Okay, now this one looks looks horrible because the black king is so active. You know, your A4 pawn is doomed. However, you can take comfort as the white player from the fact that the pawns on the king side are in the right position and if you as white can manage to win black's a7 pawn and get your king back to the f1 square you can draw that's what you've got to try and achieve so this is um so interesting enough this is i i must admit if i was playing this over the board i would quite expect to screw it up <laughs> it's that difficult because you have a critical move here. What is it as white? One move here will, will save you and draw, and uh, other moves will lose. Is it king a3? I'm afraid not. King a3 loses. I'll show you why, shall I? Yeah, might, please. Might be helpful. Is it King C3? Yeah. So this is what happens after King A3. And you're not in time. And you fell by one tempo. Only one tempo. Very annoying. So let's go back. The right move, King C2. And I have to confess, you know, whether I'd find that move over the board, I really don't know. It's not obvious. Okay, you could say it's the opposition, uh, but you're, you're saying goodbye to your A pawn. But you know that what you're going to do is, after he's won your A pawn, you're going to chase his king up the board and grab his A pawn. Watch what happens. You're going to outflank and pin his king to the A file. And obviously, he can only escape this. And this is quite an important point. Remember the winning principle for black now in this position. The winning principle is he, with the pawns, the black, uh, the, the H pawns are in the normal position, as Doretsky calls it. Therefore, the A pawn at the moment is behind the A6 to F1 line. And consequently, at the moment, this is a winning position for black if the A pawn can stay behind the A6 to F1 line. If the black king could be making a run over to the A pawn and could get off the A file, that would win. Okay, darling, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, but the problem we've got here is that black is going to have to move his A pawn from a6, a7 rather, because white would just keep him hemmed in. So here he goes. Now that's the concession that white was looking for. That black pawn is now on the a6 to f1 line. The position is now a draw, and it goes as follows. Bingo. Quite amazing, really. Um, and, you know, a position that's well worth 
looking at again. I, I, I can tell you, by the way, there are two excellent Endgame books that I've got. I've got quite a few, but two that I would particularly recommend. Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, where you'll find positions like this, and also um, uh, Jesus de Levea's book, 100 Endgames You Must Know. Both excellent books, both quite digestible. Probably Jesus de Levea's book's more digestible, but they're well worth uh, looking at. And if you understand some of the principles of these endings, it will save you a lot of grief uh, in your games. So anyway, this game, as I say, goes very much like this. And uh, it's a question now of just gradually picking that form up, which you do in the manner shown. I've got one more example of this. And this comes from actual, those are all studies. You could say this one is an actual game position. And this one's quite interesting. This was played at Vikings Day in, uh, 1994, the position is drawn. Um, so as a desperate last move or last ditch attempt, I should say, Black tried the move um, F3. And this is relevant to the example we've just looked at. Don't forget, look at the A pawns over there. They're on that normal position. So critical moment for White. He either, well, what does he do? There's one move here that, that draws for white. Um, what do you think he should play? G3. Well done, Colin, well done. Um, first of all, why not take the pawn? That's the obvious move, which is the mistake, by the way. And that was what was played in the game. Black played one move here and, and then White resigned. <laughs> what do you think Black should play here? There's only one winning move for Black here. King H3. Well done, Colin. Yeah, King H3 it is. It's because White can't play king f3, maintaining the opposition and hemming the black king in on the h file. Now, uh, whatever white does, it goes like this. Well, there's various variations. They're all very similar. King e3, king g3, f4, king g4. And notice, there's our line. The black f4 is behind the line. And you know that if you're behind the line, it's a win. Black King rushes over, grabs the A pawn. And uh, we can illustrate, in case you need convincing still, bingo. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, big mistake to take, King H3, exclamation mark. And if you try a four, for example, here, by white, <clears throat> doesn't make any difference. Same thing, if you, Try king to e2. Black can play f4. And although that pawn has now crossed or is on the line from h6 to uh, uh, f1, it doesn't matter because you're going to win the pawn. And this is a one ending. Just so you all know, um, if you get your king in front of your pawn and your king is on the sixth rank, your sixth rank, uh, you're going you're gonna to win regardless of whose move it is. Even if the white king were on f1 here, it doesn't matter whose move it is, it's a win. So uh, that would win quite easily. So let's go back to the correct play. This way. The correct move was g, not, not that, was g3. And the good thing about this move is that black now thought he could win here. Um, or perhaps thought he could win, but, but in fact he can't, because after f4, which is like the only move to try and maintain the advantage, what we've got now is that classic ending I was showing you in all the previous examples, but in this one, the black f pawn has crossed the line from h6 to c1. So the rest of this, and, and here, this is an easy draw, obviously f2 would stalemate, 
So this is quite easy. There we go again. We've achieved the drawn position. Okay. So I'm moving on now to rook and pawn endings. Can I ask a question, Nigel? Yeah, sure. Um, going back to that quick back where you had king h3. Yeah. If I play, if I could play king f4 instead. Yeah. Was that a draw, was it? Mm, let me just get it back. Was the only move. It was an obvious king f4 looked like a move as well. Okay, let me just get it back. Sorry. Don't know why it's messing me around here. Notation gone. Okay, so let's just look at that again. So it was, it was after, it was it after takes or? So after it, takes and you were playing King H3, saying it's yeah. the only winning move. Yeah. Uh, more obvious is King F4. So, well, just, just, you know, as a cursory glance, I was just wondering what happened if that, if he played that. This is what happens. And we reach the position now where um, the pawn is going to be lost, isn't it? Uh, no, hang on a minute. It's White's move here, isn't it? So Can't see it? Your... White's move here. We're seeing the rook and pawn ending. Ah, sorry. I, my apologies. Let's stop the share. Share screen. And we're this one. Right. Yep. So this was the position you're referring to, yes? Uh, I think the king was on uh, um, F2. Right. So oh, you want to go back? Not. Let's go yeah. back to the beginning. There we are. So F3, pawn takes pawn. Yep. And then king F4. Okay. So you want to go king F4 oh, instead? I just wondered. I assume it doesn't win, but I wasn't quite sure why. Um, white goes king to E2. King now goes to g3 or, or e5, which let's try g3. Yeah. And now you go king to e3. And you're actually going to lose, are we? Almost. Yeah, what, what does black do? Because here black has to push his pawn, but then after king g4, he loses. So yeah. he can't push his pawn. Um, and now he's going to allow king into f4, taking the f5, and it will be the white guy playing for the win yeah that makes sense yeah it does yeah and if we go back to the king e5 choice instead in this position king e2 king e5 then white will get the opposition with that and that's going to be a draw so black has given away his advantage right king h3 was quite a difficult move to spot isn't it? very much so um but it relies on the you know appreciation of the opposition um and the outflanking concepts that you know i started this session on so it's quite important to remember you know the value of opposition and outflanking right okay, okay. so let's switch to the rook and pawn is how are we doing we've got another half an hour um i'm probably not going to get through all the material that i've got but we can uh you know we can some of it will be quicker than, than other stuff. So, just with just like with king and pawn endings, I'm starting off with the easier stuff. And here we've got an example of the black pawn is advancing down the board, of course. The white rook is behind him. We're um, not seeing your screen again, so uh, the position. Okay. We've got that at uh, the previous position. Yeah, sorry, apologies. That's right. Right. Should have it now. Yep. Got that? Yeah, yes. looks good. Yeah. Yep. So black pawn has got three squares to go to queen, but the rook is behind it. The white king is a long way away. Um, so the question really here is, um, how should black proceed? It's black to move. How does he proceed? Well, he's got to keep the king away. I would say king f3. Yep. Well said, whoever whoever said that. Um, that Richard. Is the, well done, Richard. It's the right move. Um, just to illustrate, f3, 
loses. And it loses because the king gets back. Nice and simple. The king stops that or queening and you lose. If, however, instead, as you just suggested, you play king f3, then you go e3. And the whole point here is you've kept the white king away and the black pawn can progress quite comfortably. There's nothing that can be done to prevent that pawn progressing. If white just checks, you just repeat moves. Um, and the white king cannot help to prevent the black pawn from queening. And this position is therefore a draw. So this is called shouldering the king away again. But in this case, it's shouldering the king away in a rook versus pawn ending, whereas we saw it earlier in a simple uh, king and pawn ending. So let's go on to our next position. Some of these are very simple. But can you see that one? Change of position? No, not yet. No. Okay. So I'll have to stop and share again. Okay. You should hopefully be able to see it now. Yep. Okay. Yes. Right, so here we've got the extra pawn on the sixth rank. Black is uh, guarding his second rank for what it's worth. Um, but the obvious winning try here for white is king to g6, which uh, we will play. And it looks like White, well, what does white, what does black do here? Rook g7. Well said. Who said that? Andrew. Well done, Andrew. Oh, hi, Andrew. I've just realised it's you. I've only just joined. <laughs> oh, well, that's why. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah, Thanks. rook g7. Well spotted. Um, yeah, the, 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 it's relying on that kind of uh, stalemate resource. Cheeky. And... Um, you know, there's no other practical move here because going back to the back rank, rook to uh, a8 would, would end up losing with white playing. I don't know if I've given the variation. Yes, I do. Rook a8 loses to rook here with a classic sort of uh, line that goes like this. And uh, the uh, game is over. So it's a well-known um, motif. So going back to the starting position. So here... Um, it, this position actually is not a win because King G6 is White's only serious winning try um, and it is well met by Rook to G7 check. So let's just uh, look at what happens with that. King G6, Rook G7 check. And now, obviously you can't take it, so King back to F5. And now the Black Rook can slide back down the file and start checking from behind. With the White King now, it, unable to find any shelter. So this would be a, a relatively simple draw. So, you know, that's fairly straightforward. And obviously it leads us on nicely to two basic positions I'm gonna cover, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, Philidor and Lucina, um, but I wasn't sure that everyone would know them. Again, do I need to change the position? Are you still getting the old position? Still old position. Okay, let's uh, give you a new share. Okay, so we're going to look at both Philidor and Lucina. Now, I don't know if everyone's still on the call, anyone's dropped off because they found it got a bit tedious, but the simple question is, is there anybody on the call who's not familiar with either Philidor or Lucina positions? And again, please don't be embarrassed. You know, quite a lot of people aren't. Sure, sure. Not familiar. Not familiar. Okay, I'll show you then. Okay. So um, they're both very important rook and pawn positions, basic positions that you should know. The Philidor position is, is a position for trying to draw against uh, rook, king and pawn. And the Lucina position is a, a technique for winning with rook, king and pawn. So we're going to see them both in this particular little um, uh, position. So what we've got here is standard position, white to play. Um, oh, no. Yeah, white. To, sorry, black to play. Oh, I've got this right. Hang on, just a minute. Let me just double check. Back to play. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's black to play here. Sorry, it is. And black to play plays this move. And this is the Philidor position. Now, the key principles of the Philidor position is that the black rook occupies his own third rank, thus preventing the white king advancing to his sixth rank. Um, and the only way the white king is going to get to the sixth rank is by using his pawn to help shelter him. So in this position, if he plays e6 to try and then move his king up the board, then the right move in the Philidor position now is not to give a check, which would be a horrible move. Sorry, I meant to do the check there. Now let's go back. Right, not to give this check, because after king there, white now threatens mate, and black can only escape mate by running with his king. And now after this check, we're going to reach uh, a very simple win with the pawn advancing like that. Dead simple, and that would be game over. So after rook to g6, pawn on, the right move is rook right the way back to the back rank. And the reason is, with that pawn on the sixth rank, as we saw in the previous example, <clears throat> all the checks from behind will mean that the white king cannot find any shelter, and there's no way that white can make progress here. He can play check on a8 and a7, but the black king can move up and down between e8 and e7, so there's just no way to make progress. So this is a dead drawn position. As you, that's it, I don't really need to go any further. So that's the um, standard Philidor position, but if let's just assume the white makes the blundering check rook b1 because that allows us to get the threat of mate and now black would have to run with his king or he, what black cannot do here is go rook b8 um, the answer to rook b8 would be what rook a7 yeah exactly swinging the rook across to the other side of the board and then of course um rook h8 mate is threatened and uh Black's going to lose his rook if he doesn't get mated because he'd have to play king f8. So in this position, as I say, king has to go to f8. Now we check, king comes out, and now we reach, we reach the Lucina position. Okay. So the, the key principles of the Lucina position are that the white king controls the queen square, the e8 square in this instance. And what white needs to do is to get his pawn to the seventh rank, which he can do quite easily, as you'll see. Say black goes here, this happens. And now we've got the standard starting position of the Lucina, because the key position here is, as I say, white controls the queen in square with his king on e8, his pawn on e7. However, the problem for the white king is he's trapped. The rook on d1 prevents him coming out onto the d file, and the king on g7, or it could be on g8, that's slightly inferior, those squares would prevent the white king from coming out to f8 or to f7. So what white needs to do now is to check the black king off the g file. And he does that by moving his rook down to a2, come around. The black rook moves up the d file. He must stay on the d file to prevent the white king from coming out. Now the white rook swings across to give check. Black king moves away. He's got a number of squares. Note that f6 is a bad move because king f8. And the king is sheltered on the f file and the rook can't go to d8 check. So the white pawn will queen next move. So that doesn't work. So instead, let's go, should we say, to h6 or h7. They're not much different. We'll go to h7. Um, and now the key move in the Lucina position is not to bring the king out because it's tempting to bring the king out. But if you do bring the king out, what happens is you get checked and you just can't escape these checks. You end up going all the way back home. Again. So what you do instead is you bring the king out. Um, I'll go back a few moves. Thank you. I think that was good. Let's go back. Okay. What you do instead of bringing the king out is you play this rook move. 
This is the key move of the Lucina that you need to remember if you're not familiar with it. You put your rook to your fourth rank. And the reason is you're going to use your rook to shelter your king or shield your king when it comes out. And you'll see how. And here it comes. And the rook now blocks against the check and the white pawn is now free to promote. So that is the Lucina position. And those two positions, the Philidor position and the Lucina position, are absolutely essential for you to know the Philidor for defending against this rook and pawn v rook and the Lucina for winning with rook and pawn v rook. However, there is another, well, there are variations on a theme and there is another position that you should also know. We're going to go to it. Um, and do I need to change screen again? Yes. Okay. Okay. In this position, um, the black rook is rather clumsily placed, which is not helpful. And that means he can't play his preferable move of rook to his third rank. He can't go rook f6 here. So um, he moves his rook back to f1 to put it to a better square. And now the black king, uh, the white king, sorry, uh, steps in on e6. Just get this up. Now, in this position, black has one move, which uh, is king to f8. Well, sorry, he's got two moves. He can go f8 or d8. But it's always desirable when you have to move your king um, to one side or the other to go to what is called the short side. Um, there are fewer files on the right side of the board from in respect to the white e-pawn than there are on the left side of the board. And that's because the black rook is going to swing to the A file and give checks from the A file, lateral checks, and that you want maximum checking distance. So in this position, um, that's the key. Black has been denied use of the A file by that last rook move by white. And the problem there here is that if black moves his rook to the B file, he hasn't got sufficient checking distance and the white king can approach that rook. So the key thing here in this type of position is you defend against the advance of that e pawn by going rook e1. Now this is called the Kling and Horwitz defense, the Kling and Horwitz method of defending against the advance. And I want to show you this again from the start position with a slightly different sequence that so goes like this. And this time we'll play king to d6. And after that, we again play this move rook e1. This is the same concept of the Klingon Horwitz method I showed just now. Now, the first thing to say about this position is black, sorry, white cannot play e6. If he plays e6, then black can check from behind. He's got the equivalent of the Philidor position. The white king has nowhere to hide. So in this position, white has no choice really, but to play either king to e6, we'll look at that in a second, or to play rook h8 check. So let's just first of all, I haven't got it there as you can see, but let's just quickly look at rook. Let's go back, sorry. Let's go, um, then. I'll have to play this move, I think, and I'll just go back this way. Yeah. Right, I want to try this move. The thing about this check is that after king to f7 forced, the key no thing to note here is that the black, the white e pawn is unable to go e6 check because it gets captured with check as well, importantly. And that's the point of the rookie one Klingon Horwitz method. It's to prevent the advance of this e pawn. And in this position, the white king can't advance because he loses his e pawn. He can't advance the e pawn with check. And he's therefore got to move his rook 
And if he moves laterally and doesn't give a check or anything, Black can check on D1 and really harass that E pawn. So this is pretty hopeless for, for White as a winning try. If we go back, the best winning try is this King E6. And this is the key thing on Horwitz method. So we're behind that E pawn with the rook, and now we have to move our king out. And we, as I say, we can go to D8 or F8. Short side is best, but interestingly, in this example I'm going to show you, going to the D, the long side still actually is drawing, believe it or not, although I would suggest you generally go to the short side. Watch what happens. And now the, it's very difficult for white to make any progress because, for example, if he goes king f6, then black just goes king to d7 and the pawn is again paralyzed. So that doesn't help. So we go back and look for another move. If he goes rook a8, say, then we just can pass because white hasn't done anything um, and he's not really made any useful progress. If we try um, King F6, or oh, we tried that, haven't we? Sorry, what was the other move? That's right. If we try Rook H7 check, then the King just goes back to D8. Again, no progress being made. So you'll conclude from that there's only, really only one move that offers any prospects, and that is the move Rook to E8. This is the one try to try and win this position. And the idea of this rook to e8 move is to play king to f7 next move and try to advance the e-pawn. And if he checks you after king to f7, then you can go king to e7 and then advance the e-pawn. And if you can get your e-pawn forward onto e6, you've achieved the Lucina position, or you will be able to achieve the full Lucina. So the whole point of the Klingon-Horwitz method is to try and prevent the white pawn get into e6 without you getting a favorable position. So in this position, after rook to e8, the best move for black is to go rook to h1 to start his lateral side checks. Now imagine this position with the black king, not on c7, but on g7, and the, white, uh, the black rook, not on h1, but on a1. That would be a, a better version of this because black would have greater checking distance. But it doesn't matter in this position, as I say, it's still sufficient. But as I say, it's generally desirable to give yourself maximum checking distance. Hence why you should have gone king f8, not king d8, a few moves back. But it doesn't matter, as I say. So this position, if rook f8, then black comes back on duty behind the pawn, once again, preventing uh, any fruitful advance. Um, so we'll go there. And if he tries king to f7 here, then we can check. And although he can harass us with king to g6, um, there's no problem here because we can harass his rook. And um, that is drawn if the two rooks are captured. And obviously if the rook deserts the e-file, black moves his rook away, he's got no problems, his king's very well placed. So that really shows that the thing on Horwitz method is a actually quite an effective method to also add to your, your repertoire. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. Um, but, well, there is one more Klingon Horwitz position to look at, a uh, simpler version. And it's, I'll have to stop and share again, I'm assuming. Okay, everybody see that new one? Yeah. Okay, so we are Klingon Horwitz position again, but this time with, it's a knight's pawn, and with a knight's pawn, um, the Klingon Horwitz defense does not work. It works with center pawns, but not with a knight's pawn, because um, there isn't the checking distance, as you'll see in a moment, the, uh, and that creates a problem. So let's see how it goes. So if white tries his rook g1 with the Klingon Horwitz method, then rook goes here, mate is threatened, king has to go to f8. And now, whoops, this happens. And again, in this position, the idea is we're gonna try and go king to h7, and it's not easy for him to stop this. 
we've achieved a, a Lucina position, which is a winning position. But if we go back to the beginning, the good thing in this position is we don't need to use the King and Horwitz defence. In this position, we can use the back rank defence. And the back rank defence works with, with knights and rooks pawns because there's your, your saw, you saw this position with pawn on the sixth earlier, and it was a, a, a bishop's pawn, and we could play rook to h7 and pawn to f7 and win that way. But there's no way to do that in this position. Um, there's just no winning plan for white here. For example, if white goes, shall we say, what, well, king here, then black can just pass. And if the pawn goes here, uh, not, sorry, pawn goes up, then black just passes. And there's no way that, that white can achieve anything because he hasn't got the opportunity of driving the king, the black king off G8 square. You know, he hasn't got an F7 check move to drive it away. So he can do absolutely nothing. Okay. Um, gonna leave the Klingon Horwitz position and move on to uh, cutting the king. <clears throat> And I'm going to stop the share, start again. <clears throat> right. So we've got a standard position where white is trying to advance up the board. The black rook is preventing the advance of the pawn at the moment. Uh, and it's difficult for the king and pawn to advance on their own. And worse still from... Um, White's point of view, the black king is very much in the vicinity of the pawn. So what we need a, a, to play a key rook move here um, to cut off the black king. So what do you suggest? Rook c1. Okay. Let's have a look. And what happens now is black plays king there. And now, for example, if king to a4, the black rook checks. And you can't advance, I'm afraid, it's going forward. Uh, yeah, let's go back. You can't advance because you'll lose your pawn naturally. There isn't enough checking distance. You have to go back. And then you're not making any progress because the black king is too close. Um, so if you try instead, go back a few minutes. Let's get this back to the beginning, sorry. The right way of cutting it is with rook h5. And it's, this is the thing to remember. It's not always about cutting off on the file. You can cut off on the rank. And this is a more effective um, approach because once the b-pawn has got past b5, the black king will no longer be able to help in defending against the pawn's advance. So play could continue like this. And then the pawn is just going to be sheltered home. And uh, uh, okay, the black king has managed to take a better position here, but unfortunately the white king is gonna get in front of the pawn and ultimately he'll achieve his Lucina position. And that will be a win. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, guys, um, and I don't know how much longer you guys want to go on. I, I personally wouldn't want to go a lot longer. So, what do you think? Another five minutes? Yeah, another, one more position. Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more then. Right. Okay, this is similar to the last one. Um, you can all see that one, hopefully, different one? Yes. And this is the standard frontal attack, as it's called. The black rook is trying to prevent the advance of the pawn 
by this frontal attack. And in this type of position, um, if there are three um, ranks between the rook and the pawn, which there are here, there isn't sufficient, or sorry, there's, that's too great a distance for the white king to cover to try and get up there. So, for example, if white tries to advance this way, he's just not going to be able to get up the board enough. Um, he has to play rook here to hold the pawn, otherwise he has to go back with the king. And the problem then is that the black king hits the rook, and when the rook slides over, the black king now is able to participate in the defence of the pawn advance. So that, that is a key problem with this position. Um, if we go back, though, and look at um, that white tries, let's see, let's play a couple of daft moves. I'm going to play this check, which isn't helpful. I'm going to play even worse, king f6. King to d6 will be a draw. And the reason I'm doing that is purely to illustrate that this position, i.e. with the black king cut off from the pawn by two rank, two files, um, now makes this a one position. Previously, it was only cut off by the one file. Now he's cut off by two files. This is a one position. And you can see the difference I'm going to show you now. Mm. We come behind the pawn, and although the black king might step over to try and join the defence, unfortunately, it is too late because this pawn gets further forward. Um, and although this is possible, we reach. Um, hang on, what happened there? Yeah, we reach a rather unfortunate position because in this position, um, white is going to be gaining a win because after c6 um, black can't adopt the passive back rank defense because we know that the c pawn doesn't work against that black can't play check here because c6 wins and he hasn't got time to go rook down to a2 is that given oh, h2 sorry because of this rook checking here and white wins this way so the key thing to remember, going back to the beginning, this position was my starting position. When the pawn, the white pawn is three, there's three ranks between the pawn and the rook on the back rank. This is called the frontal attack. This is only winning if you can cut the defending king off by two files, not one file. Cut off by one file here, it's a draw. If you can cut him off by two files, there is a win to be had. And I think that's it, gentlemen. Uh, I, I don't forgot any ladies, but I think it's just gentlemen. Yeah. So I've. I've yes. <laughs> oh, my apologies, Christine. <laughs> you were very quiet there in the background. <laughs> you weren't there earlier. <laughs> no, I wasn't. That's what. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's it, guys uh, and lady. So uh, I hope you found that stuff uh, useful. I don't know if you're like me. You're probably feeling a bit tired because. Um, I was feeling a lot more energetic when we were doing the king and pawn stuff. And I remember doing this the first time and it was much the same. You get tired as you get further into it and it becomes more difficult to go into depth in some of the variations. I think it was a very, very instructive selection of positions, Nigel. So, uh, yeah, thank you, okay. Nigel. I, I don't thank you think, very much, Nigel. Always informative. Thank you. I don't, think, good. Very good <laughs> I don't think people perhaps appreciate... Um, the number of endings that end as rook and rook and pawn versus rook, or or before that, rook and pawns versus rook and pawns, which then turns into, you know, you have to sack the rook for the uh, ending uh, pr promoted pawn, and then try and defend rook and pawn. You know, so uh, <clears throat> they're probably the most important end game of all to study: rook and pawn versus rook, and uh, definitely. And before you do that, you should study king and pawn. King well, exactly. I, I, I started with king and pawn endings because, you know, everything can ultimately boil down to king and pawn endings. And, and you need to know how to play some of those basic king and pawn endings. And some of them can occur more often than you would imagine. But you're quite right, John, that rook and pawn endings are, as 
I'm sure we all know, the most common end games that we get. Um, and indeed, it's often said, isn't it, that you know, rook and pawn end is notoriously drawn, particularly there's only a one pawn advantage. But then you've got to really know how to play those positions accurately to draw them when they're drawn and to win them when they're winnable. And I so think it, there's a lot to be covered. And the, and these fun, the difference between king and pawn endings and all other endings with Ow. pinkies on is uh, they're, they're, ex they're exact. You yeah. Know, they're, um, the, the, you know, king and pawn endings are, are exact. And, Absolutely. And you, can, you can calculate them out all the way to the end. Yeah. Uh, you need precise calculation and they can be quite tactical because there can be some clever finesses that can occur in positions and tactical resources that you, you sometimes you'd expect tactics in the opening and the middle game. You don't always expect them in the end game, but they can arise and you need to be alert to them. And I, and I think um, everyone that studies King and Pawn endings should 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 look at studies. Yeah, you know some yeah. of the most some of the most instructive studies are um, extremely helpful in understanding King and Pawn ending. Yeah, well, that Troitsky one that I showed you earlier is a, is a very impressive example of several motifs of the outside pass pawn of the square of um, you know blockading or obstructing a path into a particular uh, position as well as avoiding obviously the threat of that simple mate uh, with king g3 and the advance of the h pawn um so there, there are lots of interesting nuances and, and i've looked at this this material quite a few times and i can assure you that even having looked at it quite a few times i still don't remember it all that well on occasion so you, we have to remind ourselves of these things even if we're familiar with them the okay. thing you showed, Nigel, with the rook g7 sacrifice drawing. Yeah. I, I once fell for that in a well, it's easily done, game. Very rook, easily done. <laughs> well, I had a rook and two pawns to his rook, and he played <laughs> rook g7. Yeah. I realised I couldn't take yeah. it. Very frustrating when you blow it like that. Yeah, yeah it was. Okay, well, I'll... So, yeah, thank you for inviting me to your session. I uh, hope you find this useful and I hope it's available to other people who might want to see it. Um, and uh, good, wish you success with your ongoing sessions. Thank well, you thank very you much, Nigel. Nigel. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, the, thank you, um, just, just before Bye. everyone disappears, just want to say a couple of things, uh, as well as thanking Nigel. Uh, the, the video of Nigel's presentation will be posted on our website. Um, a link to it will be posted either tomorrow or Thursday. So that will be there if you if you wish to re review um, any of the talk or if you uh, if you join late, you can catch up on the uh, King and Pawn uh, session at the start. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is uh, that we have um, uh, we have online membership of Camberley Chess Club. Uh, it costs just £10. It helps us to fund uh, our activities, including um, the talk next week from David Howell, to which everyone's most welcome. Um, I'll be sending out information about that. So uh, online members will get the invitation automatically. Uh, Non-members can request a link in the same way that they've done for tonight. Um, and um, yeah, please keep an eye on our website, join the events, um, join the Sunday arena uh, our long tournament that we've got. Everyone's most welcome and uh, see you again soon. Okay. Great. Well, goodbye, everybody. See you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Enjoy. Bye. 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 See you soon. Bye. Good night, y'all. Yeah, cheers. Bye. 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 Right. Well, we broke the record there with 41. 41 yeah, participants. Very good. Very good turnout. Thank you for inviting me, guys. I appreciate it. No, no, it's a pleasure. Where, 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 where are you geographically? Chicago, USA. Okay, so the time... Uh... Six hours early. So, <laughs> Six okay. hours earlier. Hey, sorry, sorry, Chris, I didn't see your email. I was, uh, I was trying to... Uh... 
I was trying to learn something about King and Porn endings. And, no, uh, no, that's okay. I just happened to uh, catch the link on uh, Chessbook Collectors' uh, Facebook page. Oh, I, right. I wanted to ask and, you. And I, and I only saw it five minutes before you started, so I really didn't think you were going to respond. So I went away and I came back, and there you were. So I appreciate yeah, I, that. I, I caught up with three people at the uh, at the tea break, so I'm glad you joined for the second, uh, the, the you know the the the, the second half. Uh, but as I say, the um, the first half you can catch up with on the video so oh, yeah well like i said i was just uh, trying to be opportunistic you know i uh i don't play a lot but i enjoy the uh, i enjoy the studying and i just didn't sort of enjoy the culture so it was very enjoyable to and and i learned some things you know things you forget you know you you know a lot of those little uh, nuances you know when you learn them but uh like he was saying even he screws them up on the board when he comes up with them even after training people <laughs> No. And I think I think you do have to be very familiar to you know to be able to produce it under pressure you know against the clock. Yeah. You know. But you got to play a lot it's of games. Like you you got to know it so well; it's almost automatic. You know, in a way. Yeah. If you don't know that stuff, I mean, you can't play you know quick games and and calculate that mm -hmm. stuff usually. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful to know it. But uh, anyway, it was very nice, and I want to thank you for offering the uh, uh, the opportunity. It was uh, very interesting and. Uh, Looks like you've got a good club there. How many members do you have? Well, we've got uh, we've got forty online members. Um, oh, okay. Over the fourteen months we've been running these weekly sessions, um, I've come now compiled a list of about one hundred and twenty people that have attended one or more uh, of the Zoom meetings. So oh, so this is an ex this is not an extension of a, a regular in-house club that you had back. Yeah, in the day. yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a it, it's a club that's been going for uh, since the early nineteen seventies. Oh, okay. Um, and be because of the COVID lockdown, we couldn't meet face to face. Right. And, so, and we decided <laughs> rather than to simply put the club into abeyance during lockdown, we'd we'd do something else. And uh, um, yeah, and it's proved very popular. So the. The, the attendance for these meetings is actually much bigger than we'd have for face-to-face -face meetings in the past. Yeah, we, oh. need, we need more lockdowns to grow the membership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so um, when, when the, the COVID crisis is over, which, you know, and hopefully we'll soon be able to go back to playing face-to-face, -face, we intend right. to keep the online sessions going in some, in some form to, you know, harness what we've achieved in the, in, in the last year. We're not, we're not going to throw that away by simply uh, closing down the online club yeah i think more 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 touches is probably better yeah um how do you get how do you get your speakers just people you know or mainly yeah 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 just yeah i mean i knew people, people, people we know speculative yeah, yeah. speculative requests our treasurer paul sloan seems to be remarkable at firing out requests to uh, big name speakers and they say yes which is what he did for Michael Adams three weeks ago. Wow, that's David crazy. Howell, David Howell next week. So that's, you know, that's the UK's number one and two players. Right. Talking Is that even court. affordable or are they doing that uh, with a very small stipend or uh, are they volunteering their time? I'm not sure we could give the details for that, but. No, no, I'm sure. I'm not asking how much. <laughs> the only reason I ask it's, is uh, for my fishing club, I'm the uh, speaker chairman. So yeah. uh, I also have uh, a monthly obligation to find people that can fit in the budget. Is there it, is, you know, there it's is not a prohibitive provided, provided we get people to uh, contribute the, you know, the voluntary 10 pounds online subscription. Yeah. There, there is a commercial arrangement, but needless to say, when I do the presentation, I actually have to pay to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. There's some months I do my, I, there's some months I do the presentation too for, for, you know, I see how much I pay in my speakers and then I do it. It's like, wait a minute here. I'm paying my own membership and I'm working at it. I'm doing it. Go on, don't you but, pay uh, up to watch you do the presentation? Isn't that how it works? I oh, should, totally. yeah, I should. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> I should, although maybe uh, maybe it's because I just like to hear myself talk. So you know that's an opportunity cool. <laughs> instead of a cost. <laughs> All right. Anyway, gentlemen, well, good All luck right. on uh, expanding. And uh, you've got my email, so I don't I've know. I've got your right. email. I'll, I'll I'll send you um I'll send you a link to the David Howell talk next week. You'll get. Yeah, that. I don't know if you guys put out a little newsletter or you have a mailing list or anything, but uh, yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, and then. 
you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But I do appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, okay, great. guys. Bye bye. Right. Okie doke. Right. And Richard, I'm going as well. So thank you very much. Been very interesting. Just before you go, Richard, where, where did you hear about us? Was it Facebook? Email? Yeah, Facebook. I think I'm not a big Facebooker, but I think I was just flicking through. And like the guy just said, uh, uh, um, the the chess book collectors, not that I'm an avid collector. I, I don't know. I've got about 30 books over the years. Um, and yeah, I saw it there and I thought that sounds interesting. We try, we, we don't get the same response in our club. They're not as keen as on, on online stuff, but um, what is your club? it's uh, not as exotic as Chicago, I'm afraid. Um, Bedford. Oh, okay. Yeah. In country. Yeah. yeah, 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 same, yeah, that town. It's now, um, well, obviously, Mr. Plasky, I don't know where he is, Spain or somewhere, I think, but yeah, um, yeah. You, you probably know the Ledger brothers, or some of you will do. Yeah. And they all hail, hail from Bedford. Yeah. And, and one is our, our main guy. But in fact, there was a, I think, there was a 4 NCL weekend that was at a hotel, hotel in Bedford. Yeah. I remember. Because we, I think they tried to have a congress there, but then bizarrely it got cancelled with a couple of days to go. I, I don't know the background, but something happened. But um, yeah, I, I, strangely, I don't know why the 4NCL did it, but or do it. But um, I grew up in a small town the other side of Northampton called Daventry, and uh, 4NCL is often there, which is really weird yeah. to me. But uh, I guess it's just somewhere in the middle that everybody can get to. Yeah, I think the, the hotel in Bedford was adjacent to the rowing club, as I remember. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so, uh, although yeah, some, I, there, was, there was some confusion about paying for car parks or something like that, but uh, uh, right, yeah. I think it all got sorted in the end. But, yeah, uh, I don't know Camberley particularly well. I did study in London and I was, um, I did play for Hendon for a few years in the London League when oh, I was at, uh, at university down there a few, uh, 30 odd, 40 years, 40 years ago. Um, so yeah, long time. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I took a punt today, and I hit. I kind of hit a whole load of Facebook groups, and uh, obviously it paid off. So yeah, we, we, we got a lot of ex, We got a lot of requests for the link just to, just today. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be careful. You don't. You know, you might get end up. Yeah. If I yeah. spam the group and then people ban me, I'm uh, that's not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I did it on the premise that Nigel is a chess author, so I thought. But now, um, yeah. Um, but now um, I've got your email address, Richard. I'll include you on the distribution, and if you'd like to pass on the information to your fellow Bedford club members, that would, uh, you know, that would be great. Everyone's welcome. Yeah, I will do. All yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and the, the the money that you say is voluntary, but really you'd like to contribute because if I tell the others, well. It, but uh, you know, I, I, it's, on it's my a, view is you let, let it's, a, it's, it's encouraged, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, encourage them to come to a meeting, and they, and they, and then they'll either like it or they won't, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, if we say we say come along to a, a, a couple of meetings, and if you you know if you feel you want to keep coming, then you know we strongly encourage a contribution. Yeah, well, fair enough. It's not much, is it, really, in this day and age? It's probably about the price of a pint in Campley. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, all right, good to see you guys. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I'll uh, close this and uh, yeah. see you later. Bye. Cheerio. See ya.